148 tornadoes in 24 hours across 13 states and Canada. They ravage neighborhoods. It looked like a bomb had gone off. Taking hundreds of lives. It was the scariest moment of my life. And injuring thousands more. It is a super outbreak that is unlike anything ever recorded. One that triggered a weather forecasting revolution. The super outbreak is the number one event that would have an impact on the way we operate today. On this episode of When Weather Changed History, the shocking weather catastrophe known as the super outbreak. And how this monumental disaster gave rise to groundbreaking discoveries and new technologies to better foresee and track killer storms. The difference in technology between today and then is just off the charts. tornado, perhaps the most vicious weather phenomenon. They can pack winds more than 300 miles per hour and can destroy lives in seconds. An F4 or F5 uh, storm literally wipes uh, homes clean off their foundation. The only thing that remains is anything that's below ground. Should you find yourself in the path of an F5, the National Weather Service's recommendation is clear. Get underground. Under no circumstances should they try and outrun a tornado. The National Weather Service has 122 offices around the country, scanning the atmosphere for severe weather 24 hours a day. One tool, more than any other, powers their forecasting. Advanced Doppler radar. It enables forecasters to see inside a storm and detect its potential for violence. You can actually see winds within these thunderstorms, and that's what is so critical in order to be able to tell if a tornado is forming within the storms. Computerized communications and a cross-country network of weather radio stations allow faster warnings than ever before. We get the warning out literally within seconds of when we hit the enter button on our computers. The results are definitive. Fewer Americans lose their lives in tornadoes than in years past. These advances are the legacy of April 3rd, 1974, a pivotal day in American weather history. Beginning on that day, 148 separate tornadoes including six devastating F-5s, would rip across the country, killing more than 300 people and injuring thousands in just 24 hours. It would become known as the Super Outbreak. April 3rd, 1974, Louisville, Kentucky. David Reeves is a lead forecaster in the Louisville office of the National Weather Service. When Reeves reports for work that afternoon, he finds his colleagues already very busy. They were getting reports of west of here of what was going on out in West Kentucky. The weather over the past few days has been a turbulent mix of thunderstorms and tornadoes caused by a clash of air currents. Uh, there was a, a large low pressure system off to the west. To the south was warm, moist air. To the north and, and northwest, cooler, drier air. On this day, the conditions for possible tornadoes are in place. You have to have strong winds aloft, and you have to have the instability. And in this case, uh, we had massive proportions of both. Reeves and his colleagues know that the weather system swirling above the U.S. is unstable and dangerous. Their technology is among the best available at the time. Meteorologists can track storm movements, but they don't have the ability to see tornadoes forming. In 1974, the National Weather Service does have radar technology, 
But it's not the advanced radar we know today. Invented during World War II, the older technology is better suited for tracking solid objects, like enemy aircraft. It is not well equipped for tracking tornadoes. You have this round scope and you have this thing going around, it would put a yellow or a greenish spot on bright, just a light, a spot. You would just see a print, basically, of the storm that was out there. It kind of looked like a green blob. By keeping an eye on those green blobs, forecasters can track the position of the storm, but the meteorologists have to track the storm's movement by hand. We would take a grease pencil and circle the, the spot on the radar and go back 15 minutes later, and we could calculate how far it moved, and we'd come up with some idea of the direction and speed of movement but it was the best way he had it. Although meteorologists can accurately forecast the severe weather, their limited radar does not see tornadoes inside the storms. And there is no way to measure a storm's severity or the potential for violent tornadoes. This will cause forecasters to underestimate the worst tornado outbreak in recorded history, which gets underway on the afternoon of April 3rd, 1974. Brandenburg, Kentucky, on the Ohio River, nearly 45 miles from Louisville. Brandenburg is a rural town of about 1,700. Jane Willis and her family run the local newspaper, the Meade County Messenger. My father was the publisher, and my mother was the managing editor. We were very much a country paper. About 4 p.m. after visiting friends, Jane returns to the office. Conversation at the newspaper revolves around the weather. Just two days earlier, 23 tornadoes had developed across the central and southern United States, causing wind damage right in their own county. That storm and the devastation it caused is fresh on the minds of the Willis family when they look outside that afternoon. The sky turned kind of a green, yellow, and it it felt different. And then my mother said, it's a storm, it's a storm. All right, everybody, it's the basement. A massive F5 slams into the river town. The Willises and their employees scramble into the basement as the tornado roars overhead. We were in the stairwell every bit of dust from this 100-year-old building was being sucked out of the woodwork. The F5 tornado grinds through the heart of Brandenburg. Within minutes, the twister is gone, but the destruction is overwhelming. About half of the town's buildings are destroyed. 31 people are killed. Nearly one out of every seven residents injured. At the Messenger newspaper office, the Willis family is unharmed. They stumble out of the basement and into a different world. I saw devastation. The town was just destroyed. This was the end of Brandenburg as I knew it. Jane learns that the friends she visited moments before are dead. It was absolutely overwhelming. About 45 miles away from Brandenburg in Louisville, Dave Reeves and his fellow forecasters at the National Weather Service have no idea what's happened. Looking at their radar, they could see the path of the storm, but they could not detect the tornado. Only when they hear news of it on the radio do they understand the reality of the green blobs on their radar? We learned real quick that every one of those things was producing severe weather. Now, just minutes after learning about the devastation in Brandenburg, Reeves sees another disaster looming on his radar. And the spot that caused the tornado in Brandenburg was in line. It was headed right toward us. The storm is now heading for Kentucky's largest city, Louisville. April 3rd, 1974. 
Brandenburg, Kentucky is in ruins after an F5 tornado strike. Nearly 45 miles away in Louisville, National Weather Service meteorologist David Reeves couldn't see the tornado on his radar. But he knows from radio reports that storms are headed his way. Our little radar was showing that this spot had passed over Brandenburg and was headed directly toward Louisville. And we put out a warning for Louisville. This is Dave Reeves with the National Weather Service. Well, we do have a pretty uh, wild and rugged uh, weather picture on our hands here. That afternoon in Louisville, traffic reporter Dick Gilbert is in the sky covering the daily traffic for WHAS radio. So uh, be prepared for it as you're driving. Gilbert, a former Air Force pilot, also flies the helicopter. My dad was the only person who could see what was really going on at that point. Every day, he checks on his 14-year-old daughter, Candace. Gilbert, a widower, uses his chopper to make sure she's safe at home after school. He would fly over the house, and the routine was that I would have to run out in the front yard and wave to him and let him know that I was OK. But this day is far from routine. The sky has turned pitch black when Candace sees her dad flying overhead. He was only about maybe 100 feet off the ground. And with the clear bubble of the helicopter, I could see him very clearly. And I could see him say, get in the basement. And he's making violent, circular motions with his hands. Candace heads underground as her father flies back toward the city. 4.37 p.m. It is swirling around. Gilbert spots a funnel forming above Louisville. It looks like a smoke underneath it. There is no real tight, uh, definitive tornado as such. It's still turning in a large, yes, there's one now. Started, yes, dipping down from the bottom of the cloud. Because of Gilbert's broadcast, thousands of listeners take shelter. Forecasters on the ground in Louisville are stymied by their incomplete radar picture. But from his vantage point in the sky, Gilbert can report a blow-by-blow -blow of the tornado's path. WHAS TV and radio use Gilbert's area warning to alert people to take shelter. He was telling you where it is at this moment and where it looks like it's headed. We put the bulletin out that a tornado had touched ground a funnel cloud has been sighted moving northeast from McNeely Lake. Please be on guard in those areas and, if necessary, take a place of safety. The Louisville tornado touches down at Standerford Airport, home to an office of the National Weather Service. Meteorologist John Burke is standing in front of the window and goes live on WHES radio as the tornado approaches. Yeah, but here comes the wind. We're hitting winds up the good gracious sakes alive. How high is the wind speed at this time? There's 50 right there. By golly, the whole thing is going, here, I'm going, good on. Bert quickly backs away from the window. Dick Gilbert continues to track the tornado from the air as it pounds Louisville. He had a line that nearly everyone who remembers that day will repeat to me. Now, if I'm right over the fairgrounds, the horse barns are no more. It totally wiped out the horse barns. The tornado then heads straight for northeast Louisville. Teenagers Valerie and Jeff Underhill have just arrived home from school. We had a golden retriever who was very active and, and always anxious to get outside. I remember that day, in hindsight, that he came out on the back stoop, sniffed around, and wanted to go right back inside. The winds begin to pick up as Jeff heads inside with his dog. The teenager doesn't think much about the dog's strange behavior. His parents are at work in downtown Louisville when they find out a tornado is headed straight for their neighborhood. They immediately call home to warn their children. I said, you all should get to the basement. Underhill and his wife race home to be with their children. 
We turned on the radio as we were driving home and actually listened to Mr. Gilbert broadcast how he was following the tornado in a helicopter. I heard my sister yelp from out in the kitchen, and I ran out to see what it was. She said, quickly, look out the, the kitchen window. We couldn't see a funnel. We just saw the black mass moving in our direction and things flying across the backyard. Valerie and Jeff grab the family dog and run to their basement. We went over underneath the pinball machine, and literally within a moment after crouching down in that area, it got very loud above us. We thought the house was going to come crashing down on us. I can remember my sister and I hugging each other, holding on to the dog at the same time as tightly as we could, and literally the fear that this is the end. When George and Ann Underhill arrive home, they find their streets blocked off by debris, their neighborhood destroyed. We were in total panic because they had told us that there's no way anybody could have lived. On a street corner near their home, the Underhills find Valerie and Jeff shaken but safe. Their house is decimated. The only thing left standing intact was one bathroom in the center of the first floor. It's very emotional at times when I even think about it to realize how close we had come to losing our children. 900 buildings in Louisville are damaged beyond repair from the tornado that was on the ground for more than 20 minutes. More than 200 residents are injured by the F4 tornado. Incredibly, only two people die. Many credit Dick Gilbert's live reports for saving so many lives. Be very, very careful. Dick Gilbert, Skywatch 84. The rest of Kentucky will not get the benefit of Gilbert's aerial broadcast. We had no idea that it was as widespread as it was. They just kept going, kept going. Just minutes after the Louisville strike, yet another destructive tornado will form over the town of Xenia, Ohio. The town will have little warning. April 3rd, 1974. Two powerful tornadoes have torn through Louisville and Brandenburg, Kentucky. And it's not over yet. More tornadoes break out across the South, the Midwest, and the Ohio River Valley. Perhaps the strongest tornado of all is the one that hits Xenia, Ohio. As it barrels into town, most residents are completely unaware. Like many other communities in 1974, Xenia, with a population of 25,000, doesn't have tornado sirens. 17-year-old Maureen Clark is seven weeks from graduation at Xenia High. By 4.30 p.m., classes are over. But Maureen is in the auditorium practicing for the school musical with 15 other students. We were in the middle of one of the songs and suddenly the, the back door of the auditorium opens up and a girl named Ruth comes running in and is very upset and is yelling very loudly, you have to take cover. Maureen and the students run outside where they see the tornado grinding toward them. It was the scariest moment of my life because it was just this black, ominous thing out there that was coming towards us very quickly. A little more than a mile away is John Lockwood, his wife and two young children. They are all inside the church where Lockwood is pastor. He and his wife are cleaning when Lockwood looks outside a window. It got totally, totally dark outside, and I realized something very devastating was happening. The Lockwoods race for the church basement. Back at Xenia High School, the students hunker down in the main hallway. There was some yelling because we're going to die, or we're going to die, this is unbelievable, and then it hit. As the terrifying winds subside, 
the students at Xenia High emerged from their school. It just looked like a bomb had been dropped in front of the high school. As we turned around and looked at the building, all of the windows were shattered. There was no second floor. It was gone. If we had been on the stage at that point, we would have died during this tornado. There were buses on the stage. The ceiling had collapsed. It would have been the end of our lives. After riding out the storm in his church basement, Pastor Lockwood emerges to find total destruction. I could see clear downtown. I hollered at my wife and I said, Connie, we have had a very devastating storm. It takes nine minutes for the tornado to tear through Xenia. At least half of the town is leveled. The tornado has killed more than 30 and injured 1,150. It is part of the worst tornado outbreak in U.S. history. And it's not over. April 3rd, 1974. A massive tornado outbreak is underway in several states. The thing went across Illinois and Indiana up into Michigan. Parts of Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, and ultimately even Georgia. Due to their limited technology, meteorologists are confounded by the severity of the outbreak. They were able to forecast the severe weather, but they can't see the tornadoes on their radar, so they can't issue advanced warnings. In many cases, their warnings come after tornadoes have already hit the ground. Communication networks are also limited. The National Weather Service still relies on an old teletype system. We could type on a teletype machine, and it created a little ticker tape, and we could put the tape in a, a little box and go send, and it would send to the news media. Very, very labor intensive. If a, a piece of paper tape broke, you had to start over again. Very slow way to get the warning out. The sheer volume of messages put out on April 3rd overwhelms the network and jams teletype machines. The result is disastrous. Warnings come too late. Some messages never get through. At the National Weather Service office in Louisville, meteorologist John Burke erupts in frustration and anger. He took a grease pencil and slammed it down the desk. And he said, we're not doing a damn bit of good. You know, we were putting out these warnings, people still getting killed. 6 p.m. near Huntsville, Alabama, in Limestone County. Civil Defense Director Spencer Black is aware of the disaster unfolding east of the Mississippi River and knows the stormy weather is headed his way. It's in Arkansas, it's in Mississippi, and they told us by 6 o'clock, you will experience some of the most severe weather that Limestone County has ever experienced. Black's office is ill-equipped for a disaster. We had two radios, one with the county government and also one with the sheriff's department. We didn't have anything. We were one of the poorest prepared counties in the state. Limestone County has no tornado sirens. 7.05 p.m., a tornado begins to tear through the Alabama countryside. Eighteen-year-old Donnie Powers and fifteen-year-old Felisa Golden are high school sweethearts. They are in Donnie's Mustang driving on a rural road when the tornado bears down. I could see clouds forming, and I started getting scared. And I noticed Felisa, she went totally silent. She wouldn't say anything. It was raining so hard, the car didn't even want to go. It wanted to stop and stall. Suddenly, Donnie sees the tornado. There's only one evasive action he knows. I said, Felisa, open your door and get in the ditch. 
And when she opened the door, things started hitting us. I opened the door, and that's as far as I got. The rocks started coming in, hitting me in the face. And the wind was just, just very, lots of pressure inside the car. And I went through the windshield, and I don't remember landing. I was still in the car, and I was still conscious. And the car flipped three times that I know of. So I was very scared that I would not make it out of it. A short while later, strangers see Felisa badly injured on the side of the road. Someone else finds Donnie in a nearby field. They are taken separately to the hospital. The tornado will carve an 85-mile path through Alabama and into Tennessee. A short while later, a second tornado bears down, and for nearly 20 miles, follows almost the same path as the first. The two tornadoes destroy or damage more than 1,000 buildings and 200 mobile homes. They also kill 55 people and injure more than 400. Limestone County had back-to-back -back tornadoes that hit the same community twice within an hour period. Supercell thunderstorms within the same line that wound up crossing almost the exact same path. That night, Felisa and Donnie see each other in the hospital. He didn't recognize me at all, just had this blank look on his face, and it kind of scared me. Two days later, Donnie begins to regain his memory. And I started remembering, hey, Felisa was with me, and that's when I asked about Felisa, how was Felisa? Every day for the next seven weeks, Donnie visits Felisa in the hospital. The experience brings them closer together. It showed us that life can be taken away from us really quick, and we decided that we wanted to get married and start our life, and we did. In all, 10 tornadoes tear through Alabama on April 3rd, causing more than $50 million in damages. Uh, we got about five tornadoes overturned here. The final death toll in Alabama, 86, with nearly 1,000 people injured. It was the worst by far and has been since that date. Within the space of five hours, six lethal F5 tornadoes have struck the Midwest and Southeast United States. 30 were ranked four or five. No other outbreak has come anywhere near that. Their paths shatter common beliefs about the behaviors of tornadoes. Scientists and the public learn tornadoes can cross mountains and valleys. They can also traverse rivers. The tornado that hit Brandenburg crossed over the Ohio River into Indiana. After the F4 roared through Louisville, it dispelled another myth, showing the public and scientists that tornadoes can strike metropolitan cities. We now know it's really uh, was just the fluke of the rareness of tornadoes, that they can really strike anywhere they feel like it when the conditions are correct. The 1974 super outbreak also ends a long-held belief about opening windows when a tornado approaches. People thought that it was uh, better to open windows because of a trapped higher pressure that was inside the house, and then when the tornado's low pressure went over, houses exploded outward. But as the outbreak showed all too well, homes are destroyed not by a change in air pressure, but by high winds. Instead of opening windows, people should immediately seek shelter. The next day, April 4th, 1974, Americans wake up to news of one of the worst tornado disasters in U.S. history. In just 24 hours, an outbreak of 148 tornadoes in 13 states had carved a path of destruction totaling more than 2,500 miles. More than 300 were killed, about 5,500 people injured. This was a pretty much unprecedented for, for the public and for the meteorologists who had to deal with it. As tornado outbreaks go, this is as bad as they get. The prospect of rebuilding is daunting. 
it was a mind-boggling disaster. And I thought, how are we going to get back to where we were? And how long is it going to take? For the forecasting community and tornado scientists, the aftermath of the outbreak is painful. If we had a better radar, we would have probably have done a better job. Better radar could have saved lives. This outbreak will change that and trigger a revolution in forecasting. The super outbreak is the number one event that uh, would have an impact on the way we operate today. April 1974. After the tornado super outbreak, scientists, forecasters, and the government vow to overhaul the way tornadoes are predicted and tracked. Ted Fujita, a well-known weather scientist, launches a comprehensive effort to understand what happened in the outbreak. The Weather Channel's severe weather expert, Greg Forbes, was a graduate student on Fujita's tornado research team. They were busily mapping their strategy the day after the outbreak. We spent April 4th trying to collect as much information as we could, getting maps, buying film, arranging for a renting aircraft. April 5th. From the air, the teams inspect the giant land scars created by the tornadoes. They examine the destruction left by a tornado in Monticello, Indiana, which appears to have traveled 121 miles on the ground. It just seemed like the damage kept going and going and going. It was amazing. As the team investigates, they determine that the damage was done not by one, but by two tornadoes. Fujita would later determine that these two tornadoes were part of a whole family of nine tornadoes, causing a path of destruction nearly 260 miles long in Illinois and Indiana. Between April and July, the researchers visit many locations, including Brandenburg and Louisville, Kentucky, Xenia, Ohio, and Limestone County, Alabama. Fujita's goal is to rank each of the 148 tornadoes in terms of wind speed and strength. So when he went to Brandenburg, he was interested in a cemetery. He could calculate the mass of a headstone. If it was moved, it, it took a certain force to do that. So he could try to make an estimation of the wind speed, whatever it took to move that block of granite. Fujita is also seeking to prove a theory he has been developing about tornadoes. He believes that instead of containing one funnel, tornadoes consist of multiple vortices. While proving the theory, Fujita and Forbes benefit from the use of a new technology, personal movie cameras. Citizens document the disasters as they unfold and share the images with scientists. They were flooded with all these pictures of the actual storms moving. There's several little vortexes, funnels rotating around, and they caught all this on video. One movie in particular of Xenia, Ohio, was taken by a 16-year-old, Bruce Boyd. He filmed the tornado as it was just beginning to carve a 32-mile path through the heart of his hometown. Frame by frame, Fujita studies the film and can see it had multiple vortices. It showed a very, very tiny suction vortex within it revolving about the pair tornadoes. We certainly saw evidence of these suction vortices in most of the tornadoes. Fujita's discoveries are revolutionary. His research brings about the development of new technology and communication systems. These developments lead to faster ways to predict tornadoes and ultimately save lives. Fujita's research in 1974 also serves as a springboard for the F scale, which links damage and wind speed. As weather science evolves, his scale is revised in 2007 to better reflect a tornado's destructive power. But there is no question that without his research, there might not be a system at all. Over the next decade, old radar technology is phased out. By the mid-1980s, the National Weather Service implements a newer radar system nationwide called Doppler. 
you can actually see winds within these thunderstorms and that's what is so critical in order to be able to tell if say there's going to be damaging winds or if a tornado is forming within the storms. This is a dish that sends out a signal, a very large signal into a uh, thunderstorm and then it bounces back. The thunderstorm will actually bounce back a portion of that signal. That's what allows us to actually see the intensity of the rainfall and this is the key thing, seeing the uh, actual speed and motion of the storm uh, particles within the thunderstorm. Today, there's a new generation of radar. NEXRAD is a national network of 153 high-resolution Doppler weather radars operated by the National Weather Service. Well, the radars that we're seeing here today are off the scale compared to what we could see back in the 70s. I can zoom into a particular storm quite easily and then I can get up close and personal with a particular storm. You couldn't do that back then. That's a circulation within the thunderstorm. That's indicative that that thunderstorm is producing damaging winds and likely producing a tornado. That's the kind of thing that we look for to issue warnings. That's the kind of thing that did not exist years ago. The super tornado outbreak not only exposes radar deficiencies, but communication failures as well. In 1974, weather radio transmission is extremely limited. There were only 50 to 60 transmitters across the entire nation, and most of those were in marine locations. National Weather Service in Shreveport. In 1979, Congress approves funding for the installation of a 330-station weather radio network. That allowed us to actually give warnings to people even in the middle of the night. Over the years, the network grows to about 1,000 stations nationwide. In 1979, the National Weather Service replaces teletype machines with computers. Today, meteorologists use state-of-the-art equipment to supply forecasts. The Internet also revolutionizes how people access weather information. Anyone with a high-speed Internet connection can have more data on their home computer today than any forecaster in any office had in 1974 during the uh, super outbreak. These advances in technology and communications have clear results. The average warning lead time for tornadoes increases to 13 minutes. Most tornadoes were on the ground before we had a warning out in 1974. To go from having no warning at ground zero in 1974 to having minutes lead time to the very first uh, touchdown of a tornado is phenomenal. Those advanced warnings save lives. Annual death tolls in the triple digits were more common in the 1950s and earlier. In recent years, it's been closer to 60 fatalities per year. In 2008, the country's preparedness would be tested by another deadly outbreak. In 2008, a deadly tornado outbreak hits the U.S. and tests the technological innovations that resulted from the 1974 super outbreak. February 5th. It is presidential primary day in much of the country. That afternoon, multiple tornadoes hit Arkansas, Tennessee, and the Mississippi River Valley. It's known as a Super Tuesday outbreak. There were numerous tornadoes that day. 87 tornadoes break out. At least 57 people are killed, hundreds injured. On Super Tuesday, people had advanced warning about 16 minutes. As a result, the death toll is smaller than that of 1974. Had it occurred before the advent of new technology, far more people might have died. A tornado outbreak of this intensity uh, and this magnitude probably would have resulted in over three, four hundred fatalities. In Louisville, Kentucky, after the 1974 tornado destroyed their home, George and Ann Underhill started a construction company to restore their neighborhood. We felt that we were doing a positive thing for the community as well as starting a new venture in our life. In Xenia, Ohio, churches and schools have been constructed to resist tornado winds. State laws put in place after the 1974 super outbreak 
require that school districts have tornado drills and teach children what to do in the event of a tornado. And towns across the country have installed tornado warning sirens. Now we have a magnificent um, early warning system for you know, weather alerts, and, and it, that's in large part due to the experience that we had in 1974. For Maureen Clark, the Xenia tornado taught her to be watchful of the weather. We look for how winds are shifting. We really listen to what the forecasters are saying to us. In Alabama, Spencer Black took the lead in making Limestone County as tornado-ready as possible. We can assist people. We got resources. So you could say that this county went from nothing to being the best. Many who live through the outbreak feel protected by the new weather technology. You can watch your TV. You can look at radar system. They can tell you when a tornado is coming, and you got so much time now where we didn't have time back then. Donnie's wife, Felisa, however, isn't taking any chances. No more going out during stormy weather, none. <laughs> While all the technology in the world is no guarantee of survival, there is no doubt it can keep people safer. The more information you have, the better decisions you can make, and the better uh, uh, you can keep your family and your loved ones safe.